Okay, there we go. What are we doing? Pledges? We're going to pledge, and then we're going to talk about two individuals from the one from the, the Revolutionary War and one from the next period, so I can come and then follow it up with a, a finale. Are we going to talk anything about the Persian Gulf War? No. Nope. Are you going to be quiet while we have the pledge, or are you going to come up and do it? Which? essentially 
The Voices of the Second Awakening. Now, what's his name? And I'm saying this because he was very instrumental in saying we need to be totally involved as an American citizen in all aspects of life, including politics, including our government. Because without freedom, without God, our government does not have a basis. Okay. Famous evangelist. Mary? Charles Finney. Charles Finney. What's an evangelist? He's a person who preaches a particular thread of a message. A message that says, come to God. Come to Jesus. Huh? You should yeah. preach to Okay, now, that's two men. And now you're going to hear about a third. Because this one came all the way back, having been with and stayed with Benjamin Franklin and I'm sure George Bush. Okay, drum roll, let's have it. What? Oh. Drum roll. You want to give a drum roll or are you going to come sit down? Like a. Um, you get paid the big bucks for a drum roll, so let's have it. Drum roll or. How about a military? You don't, can you I get a military march? Fine, I want to even go with the core. Okay. Little snare drum, military. Let's go. Are you? Okay. Little cake. to them. 
monarchies were the thing that it wasn't even so much about democracy, it was about tyranny. And who knows what tyranny is? Makes you cry. Could make you cry, that's right, could make you cry. What do you think that what do you think tyranny means uh, in, in politics or government? If you have a king and he's a tyrannical king. Very expensive. Could be very expensive. Very good point. It got very expensive for the colonists. The colonists were producing a lot of wealth, but where did the wealth go? Went back to England. They didn't get to keep it in their pockets and enjoy it. There were so many strange little laws that King George passed against the colonists to keep the money, that the wealth that they produced flowing to England and out of their pockets. Do you know, at some point, metal shovels were banned in the colonies. They didn't want, King George didn't want them building enough permanence there. So metal shovels were banned. They wow. built them, but they built them anyway. You buy them from England, they built them anyway. And that's how deep the tyranny of King George went against the colonists. He wanted to steal all their wealth and keep them poor, but they started building bigger and bigger cities, and they got more and more sophisticated. And you had some very worldly people like Benjamin Franklin, who spoke a number of languages, and Thomas Jefferson, who would visit Europe, where other revolutions were happening, and, and, and people were starting to question the old monarchy system. As a matter of fact, Benjamin Franklin was very close with France. And once the American Revolution started, France supported the new revolutionaries, supported the Sons of Liberty with a lot. Of course, they hated England anyway, but that's beside the point. And then they had a revolution of their own. So, these are very interesting worldly people. Who knows what else that these, these uh, gentlemen were very well steeped in? Very, what, is, what do I mean by well steeped? Anybody know? If we're not talking about tea? <laughs> people were very knowledgeable about it. What, did, what were they very knowledgeable about? Benjamin Franklin, among other things, was a scientist and an inventor. But when you put them all together, all these great sons of liberty, George Whitfield, you put together uh, Ben Franklin, Tom Jefferson, certainly, George Washington, certainly, and their contemporaries, what else were they very, very learned about? They were well lettered. The Bible. The Bible, that's it. They knew their biblical history. They knew their Bible inside and out. As a matter of fact, not only for their time, but this time, they were extremely learned in the Torah, in the Old Testament. More than the Old Testament, just the Torah part, the first five books of Moses. They were very, very learned in Jewish history. And they took a lot of inspiration from one particular book from the Torah, from the Jewish Bible. You know what book that was? Exodus. Exodus. They took a lot of inspiration from the story of liberation from a cruel pharaoh in Egypt. And they saw their story in America as paralleling. What does that mean when I say paralleling? Being on the same track. All right? They saw their story being very similar to the Israelites. And in many ways, they modeled their revolution on They took a lot of inspiration from that. So there were not a lot of Jews living in the colonies at the time. And I'll call it America, but it's, it's technically pre-America. There weren't a lot of Jews living there. But there were, some, there were some pretty prominent ones, and there were some awfully poor ones. But there was one very interesting fellow from Poland who had recently arrived in America. Now, imagine... Poland is in Eastern Europe. Most of the colonists were from Western Europe. They are worlds apart. Chaim Solomon came from Poland. And who knows who was in charge in the areas of Poland at the time? But technically, you know, Poland was Poland at the time. The borders kept changing. You had czars. You had czars. And they were very cruel to the Jews. They passed a lot of tyrannical laws against the Jews. So there was a lot in common between the colonists of America and the Jews of Poland. But Chaim Solomon crossed all the way across Europe. He had to go by foot, by horseback. He was lucky if he caught a train at any point. May have made it to a seaport, and we don't really know about how he got to, to get a boat all the way across. But there, he couldn't take a plane, couldn't take a train straight across. How do you, you know, it's a long, long trip, and he went all the way across Europe, then all the way across the Atlantic, and landed in Philadelphia. And he fell in love 
with the idea of liberty, and he fell in love and joined the Sons of Liberty. So the Sons of Liberty, out of the Sons of Liberty, we not only have the Declaration of Independence, who knows what year that was signed? Mm, I think it was 17-something. Uh-huh. That's 100 years span you've got. You're narrowed it down. 77? Close. He was closer. 1780? Nope, getting colder. How about 1776? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to make you all a, a, a tape of the uh, Schoolhouse Rock, as you remember. Oh, thanks. No, okay. Oh, yeah, that's good stuff. There. You'll remember all kinds of facts and dates with Schoolhouse Rock. Yeah. So it's really great stuff. Uh, so, uh, and I don't want to say that that dates Chaim Solomon. Chaim Solomon's still talking about tape. That's how old I am. Okay. So, <laughs> so, some people get it, you kids don't get it. Anyway. Uh, they used to have to put a disc inside the middle of a 45 record. And, anyway. yeah. so, it'd, be, it'd be before their time, not ours. You could use a bottle cap from a soda. Anyway. So, yeah, don't pretend like you're not old enough to remember that on a 45 record. So, so, uh, so, so, so in 1776, the founding fathers some of whom were members of the Sons of Liberty, signed the Declaration of Independence. And that pretty much led to what with England? War. Right. So 1776 is when the, Revol when, when the uh, Declaration of Independence was, Independence was signed. When was the Constitution written? Um, um, Keep going down the road. Percent more answer than anyone else. So <laughs> you can only be you got to be closer than everybody else, Connor. So go for it. When was the Constitution written? Not, 1790 you're as close as anybody else. That's perfectly good. 1780, 1785. Wasn't ratified or signed by all the, the people who signed it. I think it was about 34 people who signed it until 1787. Yeah. So there's an 11-year gap between declaring independence and working out a constitution. It's a very significant amount of time to operate without a constitution, without your basic laws. And then you start amending it. Then you first start getting the first 10 amendments. What are the first 10 amendments called to the constitution? Very important. It's the Bill of Rights. Who's heard of the Bill of Rights? Should be, sure. So the first 10 amendments to the Constitution give us the Bill of Rights, and most of your rights that you enjoy today are actually derived from the first 10 that were written after it was ratified in 1787. So think about what's going on that whole period of time. So let's talk about Heinz Solomon. I'm going to actually read to you the story of Heinz Solomon who saved the American Revolution. Who thinks that's exciting? Yeah. Wow. It's, very yeah. exciting. it's a very exciting story because the story of Chaim Solomon is the story of the American Revolution. The whole story is encapsulated in his life. And the resemblance is astounding. <laughs> Sadly, these glasses are for distance. The newspaper headlines declare the shocking news. General George Washington losing to the British Redcoats. Whenever we say the Americans are losing, we're going to boo, okay? So I'm going to read that again. General George Washington losing to the British Redcoats. Boo! Whenever I do this, you go, yay. Okay, let's practice. Yay! yay. <laughs> Army greatly distressed, said an article in the New York Gazette and the Weekly Mercury. The troops have no meat. Boo! One of Washington's officers reported in the paper, many eat their shoes and shot pouches. Boo! Yay! Oh, yay! Connor, yeah. I like that. You're that hungry. I gotta, I gotta say, boo, you can eat. They need food, blankets, uniforms, and boots. Their horses are hungry. No men ever went through more or greater hardships. However, we are Americans and American soldiers. In January 1776, the year of the Declaration of Independence, High Time Solomon sat reading the New York Gazette in his house on Broad Street. How can I help, he wondered. I am only a Jewish immigrant. Chaim had just come to America from Poland. Although he missed his family and friends, he wanted more than anything to live in a free country. As a young man, Chaim had traveled throughout Europe working in banks. 
He learned how to count money, save money, and loan money. He knew the price of silver and gold and understood what money from many other countries was worth. For instance, he could exchange German marks for Russian rubles, or Polish goldens for French francs. Along the way, he learned many languages, French, German, Russian, Italian, and English. Those would be very useful skills. And of course, he knew Hebrew and Polish. By the way, many of the founding fathers also could read Hebrew. Now in New York, he put his knowledge to good use. In those days, colonists used English pounds and shillings, as well as American paper and dollars and pennies. Immigrants also brought money from their native countries and kept using it in America. Chaim was able to exchange or loan money for everyone. He was able to talk with his immigrant customers in their own languages. People found him to be honest and fair. They liked his good manners and gentle way of speaking. See the value of that? Let's give, let's give Chaim a thumbs up for a gentle way of speaking. At this time, the 13 American colonies belonged to the British Empire. <laughs> However, King George III of England did not treat the colonists well. He forced Americans to pay extra money called taxes for ordinary things like newspapers, playing cards, and tea. Boo! So the colonists declared war on England. Yay! Saying they wanted to be free and rule their own country. Among the many people who wanted change was Chaim. Yay! One day, someone knocked on Chaim's door. It was his friend. Alexander McDougall. Does anyone know about Alexander McDougall? Heard of it before, but it doesn't Went on to found a hamburger chain. No, that was McDonald's. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, who on later wants to look up and do some research on Alexander McDougall? Honors our um, historian. Are you our research historian at the Library of Covenant Fellow Teaching Gym? What? <laughs> someone, why doesn't someone think about looking up Alexander McDougall? Because this is what he looks like. This is a photograph taken. Don't look at that. Now, you're going to find out why he's sneaking around in the middle of the night. I'm leading a group called the Sons of Liberty. Yay! We secretly fight the English. Yay! A couple of years ago, when an English ship arrived here in New York, we dressed up as Indians and dumped the tea overboard. Who knows what that's called? The Boston Tea Party. Right! Tea Party. Chaim sat forward and listened. Everybody sit forward and listen. Do you want to join us? said Alexander. Yay! I must warn you, it will be dangerous. Yay! Yay! Once the British caught me for printing pamphlets and threw me in jail. Chaim thought carefully. He certainly did not want to get into trouble. On the other hand, he loved his new country and had all this, come all this way to find freedom. Yes, Chaim told Alexander, I will join your group. What do you want me to do? In June 1776, Chaim closed his profitable business. He left New York with a wagon full of supplies for the American army. Chaim rode many miles to Fort Ticonderoga at Lake George, New York. There he set up a tent to house coats, shoes, boots, and blankets, and other things the soldiers needed badly but had no way of getting. Every month, Chaim paid a fee for the right to sell these goods from his tent. That money went to a fund for widows, orphans, and retired soldiers. Yay! Good work, Mr. Solomon, said General Philip Schuyler, the officer in charge in command. Chaim even brought eyeglasses packed in little wooden boxes tied with ribbons. Try these on, he said to men who were having trouble reading. By the way, if you have trouble seeing, it's also hard to shoot British soldiers. <laughs> Local farmers also brought goods, meat, vegetables, and berries to Chaim's tent to sell to the soldiers. In April of the following year, word came that the Redcoats as the British soldiers were called, Ooh. were going to attack New York City. General Washington and his troops were far north in Massachusetts and had to journey quickly to New York. How do you think they got from Massachusetts to New York? Train. Sorry. <laughs> wagon. Wagon? And if you didn't have a horse or a wagon, how do you think you got there? No, foot and foot. And by foot, you walked. <laughs> Officers had horses. Troopers had Supplies were carried in wagons. Infantrymen had boots, if you were lucky, and Chaim was able to get you boots. 
As soon as Chaim heard the news, he packed up and headed home to New York, too. Yeah. By the time Chaim had arrived, the British had won the battle and captured New York City. Yeah. On September 20th, 1776, in the middle of the night, a fire broke out. Flames swept through the city, smoke filled the air, and by dawn, more than 400 buildings had burned down. British officers immediately suspected that the fire had been started by the Sons of Liberty. Yay! Rumors spread that these patriots would rather see their city burn down than turn it over to the British. Let's get the Sons of Liberty, cried the British. They rounded up the rebels, arrested them, and shot some of them on the spot. Chaim was now a well-known member of the Sons of Liberty. So soldiers rushed to his house and pounded on the door. Open up, you're under arrest. Look, they're even arresting his poor dog. Oh, come on. Is this arm dog? His arms are up. His arms are up, yeah. I love Washington, he looks back. No, 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 we're going to find out about somebody else, another player. We got the British, we got the Sons of Liberty. We're going to find out about another player in the American Revolution. The British, look at what color is his coat? Green. And the British wear what? Red. And the Americans wear what? Blue. Oh. That's from France. That's Wrong. Blue. British wore blue and red as well. So, the British marched Chaim off to a jail called the Old Sugar House. That sounds nice, doesn't it? The Old yeah. Sugar House? Not yeah, so nice. It's jail. Good. It was anything but sweet. A broken roof let in rain and soaked the prisoners. Cold and wet, Chaim came down with a bad cough. He was moved to another jail, the Provost Prison. This one was even worse. Prisoners crowded the cell. Hessian soldiers from Germany guarded them. He is a Hessian soldier from Germany. And do you know why the Hessian soldiers from Germany were there? They were paid to be there as mercenaries. Paid soldiers that are professionals that are paid to go fight for whichever side pays them. Are mercenaries people that do stuff to, pay, to be paid? Right. They're only fighting for whichever side pays them. They have no stakes in the war itself, which actually works out very well for the Sons of Liberty and Chaim Solomon, as we'll see in a minute. So the Hessian soldiers from Germany guarded them. Remember, what languages does Chaim speak? Um, German. What language do you think most of the British speak? English. English. They were career soldiers who fought other people's wars to earn money. The British had hired them to fight on their side and brought them over to America. Chaim understood German, so he struck up a conversation. Guten Tag, he said to the guards. Hello, when they gave him a piece of bread. He said, Danke schön. Thank you. The Hessian soldiers admired Chaim's ability to speak different languages and told their commanding officer, General Heister, about him. General Heister realized that Chaim could be useful as an interpreter. Chaim could turn the Hessians' words into English, and he could translate the British general's orders into German. Otherwise, the British and the Hessians had no way of communicating. The British told Chaim that the only way he could gain freedom was by working for the enemy, the British. General Heister released Chaim from jail on parole and gave him a job buying supplies for the British prison. And this is something that Chaim was already very good at. Chaim agreed to help them, but secretly vowed to use this opportunity to help other prisoners escape. And he did. As Chaim worked with the Hessian guards, he became friends with them. Listen, he said, why don't you run away? Pennsylvania is giving free land to any Hessian soldier who leaves the British Army. <coughs> <clears throat> Many of the guards, especially the younger ones, took Chaim's advice and deserted. General Heister had no idea what Chaim was up to and rewarded him for his services by freeing him. Yay! Chaim opened up a new office on Broad Street near City Hall, so we're still in New York. Yay. Around this time, he met Rachel Franks, the daughter of a Jewish merchant. Mm -hmm. They were married on July 6, 1777. Yay. Remember, all these events are taking place in only a year. The following summer, their son, Ezekiel, was born. Oh, yay! Meanwhile, the war raged on. The American and British navies captured each other's cargo ships. Supplies were scarce. Nevertheless, Chaim found a way to obtain and sell goods such as bread and rice. He kept working undercover with the Sons of Liberty. Chaim helped more prisoners escape from the British jails and often hid them in his own house. You see where he's hiding them under a table in case the British search his house? He probably had a basement where he came from. In August 1778, another fire broke out in New York down at the docks. English ships burned. The Redcoats again blamed the Sons of Liberty. 
The next night, as Chaim and Rachel finished dinner, they heard soldiers marching toward their house. Someone pounded on the door. Open in the name of the king! Stand with the baby. Chaim shoot Rachel into the other room. He opened the front door. You're under arrest for treason, a redcoat sergeant said. You are a spy! <laughs> Please let me say goodbye to my wife and baby, Chaim said. Make it fast, said the sergeant. Chaim hurried into the bedroom, quickly hid some gold coins in his clothes, put on his jacket, grabbed his gold pocket watch, and kissed Rachel and their baby goodbye. The Redcoats took Chaim back to Provost Prison and threw him into a cell with 20 other men. Chaim's fellow prisoners asked for news about the war. Is General Washington winning? Will he ever recapture New York? Chaim told them what he knew. That night he slept on the cold floor. His terrible cough came back. His chest hurt with every breath. A few days later, uh, the door to the cell opened and a guard led him away. Chaim appeared before the prison warden and four British officers. They read the, the charges against him. Chaim Solomon committed treason. He sheltered spies and gave them information. He plotted to burn the king's fleet of ships in the harbor of New York, and he secretly communicated with General Washington. Yay! Some of the charges were true. Others were false. Finally, the court allowed Chaim to speak. I admit that I tried to serve my country in whatever way I could, he said. The officers left the room to decide his fate. When they returned, one of them said, We find the accused Chaim Solomon guilty. Ooh. We can... Ooh. Ooh. Wait, it gets worse. <laughs> we condemn the prisoner to be hanged by the neck until dead at dawn tomorrow. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, hey, he's, he's, uh, yeah, he's the uh, right. <laughs> Not quite. Chaim was taken back to jail and kept in a cell by himself. During the night, a young Hessian guard, remember what did the Hessians speak? Uh, yeah. Hessians. He held out his watch and unwrapped the gold coins. I'll give you these if you leave my cell door open. He said, dessert, run, run north of New York to the Americans at Dobbs Ferry. I'll wait for an hour to give you a chance to get away. The guard took the watch of the coins, and in the darkness, Chaim heard a key turning in the lock. Holding his breath, he sat and waited. Then Chaim opened the door. Open! He slipped down to the cellar where the warden kept food for the prisoners. Finding the cellar doors open, he slowly lifted one of them and felt the cool night air. Chaim climbed up and ran across the street into an alleyway. He was free! Yay! Yay! Chaim raced through the streets towards his house. As he approached, he saw a British soldier standing at his door. They were already searching for him. I can't go home, Chaim thought to himself. If I do, I'll put Rachel and the baby in danger. Who remembers the baby's name? Very good. So he turned and zigzagged through the streets, out of the city, past the farms and the fields, through the forest. Now remember, he's in Manhattan, and he's run all the way up. Out of Manhattan all the way up into the farms. I mean, you got to think about this. It didn't hop the, uh, the L train up there, you know what I'm saying? So at last he reached Dobbs Ferry, where the American troops were stationed. So this is an area that's controlled by the revolutionaries. Chaim was shocked when he saw the condition of the poor soldiers. You are dressed in rags, he said. You don't even have uniforms. There is no money for the uniforms, said the soldiers. We don't have enough to eat, and we are not getting paid. So we can't send money home to our families. How can we keep on fighting? Then and there, Chaim formed a plan. Chaim went to the commanding officer, his old friend, General Alexander McDougall. Yes. Please give me a pass to Philadelphia, said Chaim. I can raise money to feed and clothe our troops. Chaim knew that Philadelphia was the biggest and busiest city in all of the colonies. Alexander gave him a pass to show the American soldiers who might stop him along the way. For days and days, Chaim walked a distance of 100 miles. He thought of his wife and baby. Would he ever see them again? At last, Chaim arrived in Philadelphia. A religious man, he looked for a synagogue and found congregation Mikvah Israel. So that was the name of the synagogue in Philadelphia where the Jews prayed. Members of the congregation liked Chaim and helped him get started in business again. He opened an office on Front Street near the busy docks. With his knowledge of foreign languages, he was able to talk to ship captains from all the different uh, countries in foreign languages 
and trade with them. So Chaim, once again, was very valuable for being a smart guy and for, for learning a lot. Representatives from France met with Chaim in coffee houses and arranged to loan him the money for the American patriots. We trust you, they said. Chaim, Chaim's friends from Congregation Mikvah Israel helped Rachel and the baby come to Philadelphia. Chaim, you see how important it is to have a religious community that you can count on? Go anywhere in the world, find a religious community that you belong to, and they'll take care of you. So right away, the congregation helped get his baby, Ezekiel and Rachel, from New York to Philadelphia. Chaim was overjoyed. His family settled into a house on Front Street where his office was located. Soon, Chaim and Rachel had two more daughters, two more children, daughters Sarah and Deborah. Aww. Now, Chaim worked higher than ever, harder than ever before. Business hardly gives me a time to think what I am doing, he wrote to a friend. Chaim worked so hard that his cough came back. Coughing spells hurt his throat and chest, so Rachel called for a doctor. Rest, the doctor ordered. I don't think I can rest, said Chaim. There's too much to do. More and more people heard about Chaim. One of them was Robert Morris. Robert Morris is another person that you should probably look up. So the official, the official school uh, research historian, Connor, will be looking he signed, up. He signed the declaration. He was one of the 30, 32 or 34 signers. Robert Morris, a Philadelphia businessman and patriot. Yay. 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 Morris had been one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Now in 1781, General Washington had appointed Morris as Minister of Finance. Washington gave Morris the full power to raise the money needed to carry on the war. Morris invited Chaim to meet at his house. On June 8, 1781, Morris wrote in his diary, I, I agreed with Mr. Chaim Solomon to assist me. Chaim became Morris's broker. He received loans or bills of exchange from France, Spain, and Holland to gain money for General Washington's troops. Usually, he charged nothing for his services. In the summer of 1781, Morris met with Washington at his headquarters north of New York. Washington needed money right away to lead a sneak attack against the British in Yorktown. They agreed there was only one person who could do the job. Who do you think that was? Hi. I am Solomon. The story goes, now this is, this is going to get very, very tough here for a second you, you, to, to understand. The story goes that on Yom Kippur, who's heard of Yom Kippur? I have. What is it? It's like, um... It's the Day of Atonement, uh. right? It's spelled out right in the Old Testament that you get one day a year to be the Day of Atonement. In Judaism, it's the holiest day of the year. It's a very special day. Chaim was attending services at Mikveh Israel. A messenger came in and asked for him, don't do business on the Sabbath, and you certainly don't do business on Yom Kippur. Robert Morris sent me, the messenger said to Chaim. He needs you to send two bills of exchange for $20,000. Who thinks $20,000 is a lot of money today? Oh, yeah. Who thinks it was a lot in 1781? Boy. It was a fortune. Members of the congregation gasped, for shame! They were shocked to hear talk of money on the holiest day of the year. Chaim, however, knew that no other time would he have so many people gathered at once. He asked the rabbi for permission to speak. And so he was allowed to address the congregation during Yom Kippur. Let us all help General Washington, he said. Yay! Yay! Within a few minutes, Chaim raised all the necessary money, including $3,000 of his own. So in one day, on the holiest day of the year, in one Jewish congregation in Philadelphia, he raised the $20,000 he needed to save General Washington at Yorktown and save the American Revolution. Thanks in, his part, thanks in part to Chaim, Washington won the Battle of Yorktown on October 19, 1781. Yay! And the British surrendered! Yay! The war was finally over. Two thumbs up! Yay! Americans everywhere. Yay. In the following years, the new American government led by George Washington still needed money. Aww. Well, they had no relationship to the British anymore. Chaim helped establish a national bank. 
the Bank of North America, and continued working with Morris. But in 1784, Chaim's health grew worse. His bad cough developed into a serious sickness, tuberculosis. On January 6, 1785, Chaim died. How old do you think he was? 83. He was 45 years old. A few months later, his wife Rachel gave birth to their fourth child, a son named Chaim Moses. That, no. Although there, I'll tell you something ironic about Connor. Chaim Solomon. Chaim Solomon left his family penniless. He had given away or loaned almost all he had for America. However, his efforts earned him an honorary place in history. Although Chaim probably never met George Washington, he stands beside him today in a statue. A bronze memorial in Chicago shows three American patriots clasping hands. Robert Morris, George Washington, and Chaim Solomon. That's what the yay. Yay! yay. And that's the story of Chaim Solomon, the Jew who saved the American Revolution. Yes, there's a copy here at the school that you guys can read again, and I'm going to suggest something else. The story is great. But also in the back of the book, there's a terrific glossary and bibliography of uh, the names of the people that are in the book, and I think you should do a little bit more research. And there are some liner notes in the front and back that mention more names and interesting things, and I think you should do some more research. Who's studying the American Revolution now? Is anyone studying the American Revolution? Two people? Josh, yeah. Everybody? Nobody? Somebody? Well, in our cases, we are. So the answer is yes. Yes or no? You're in or you're up? Yeah. You're studying the American Revolution. So there are a couple of names that we mentioned that are worth researching. Who remembers what they are? John Robert Morris, um, Alexander, um, McDougal. McDougal. Yeah, very good. Those are two people that, sh that you, should, you should research. So that is the story of Chaim Solomon. Is that an interesting story? Yeah. Did anybody know that story beforehand? No. Pretty neat story. He gave all he had. He didn't hold back. He gave all he had to make sure that there would be freedom in America. And he, he paid the price in his health, died at 45. And he paid the price that he left his family penniless, but he never regretted it. Yay. That's right. That's right. He died, he died for what he believed in. Yes, died for his, he died for his convictions and his faith. Who are you? I'm Chaim Solomon, but here's the interesting story. Chaim Solomon is from where? Poland. And you're dead. And my family is from Poland. My grandfather came from Poland when he was 16 and was also a merchant in New York. And you know what my Hebrew name is? Chaim. Oh. My Hebrew name is Chaim Manish. Chaim Manish ben Azriel. So that's some interesting things. That means Chaim Manish, son of Azriel, is my father's uh, Hebrew name. For example, my daughter, who you met, yeah. Everybody remember meeting my daughter, Shira? Yeah, the one I accidentally chipped in the chapel. She's Shira Bachheim Vanish. Okay. Shira, daughter of Chaim Vanish. Mm -hmm. Or Shira Bachheim Vanish Ben Azriel. Uh, Which is Shira, daughter of Chaim Vanish, son of Azriel. Anyway, I thought that that was an interesting connection that I have to Chaim Solomon. We're both named Chaim and we both are descended from Poland. I thought that was interesting. Are there any other questions? Everyone have fun with chapel today? Yeah! Thank you. Thank you very much. Are you? Did Chaim ever go into battle or something? No, he was actually not a soldier. He really uh, was not, uh, his contribution was not in fighting. He was not a military man. He provided all the back end uh, uh, supplies that soldiers need to fight. So he helped get them ammunition and he got them their clothes. Remember, when you're fighting in New York, upstate New York in the winter, it's not like winter in Florida. It is terrible. To, as a matter of fact, George Washington almost died in a what battle in uh, New York, upstate New York? Anybody know? Was it um, Valley Forge? It was Valley Forge. Valley Forge is not far from what other famous New York landmark? Statue of Liberty? No, Statue of Liberty doesn't come till later. West Point. The 
West Point Military Academy is not that far from Valley Forge. And West Point became very important because who turned over the keys to West Point to the British? Hi. No, 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 they named an egg dish after him. Yeah, egg dish. Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold was in charge of West Point, and he actually turned over the keys of one of the most, the, the only military academy in in the uh, in America to the British. And so all these things are connected. But the winters in upstate New York are quite harsh, and you can't just go buy a down jacket at REI uh, or outdoor roll like you can today. So Chaim provided what they call in the army logistics. Anyone heard of logistics? Logistics, you ever hear of an army travels on its stomach? Yeah. Anybody know who said that? Another famous Polish person, Clausewitz. Anyway, we'll get too deep into history. But Clausewitz wrote an army travels on its stomach. And so that's very true. So Chaim Solomon provided the logistics to get the soldiers food, uniforms, ammunition, shot, all the equipment they needed to fight. But in fact, you're, you're the long answer to your question. He actually was not a soldier himself. Um, As a matter of fact, other than George Washington, when you think about the founding fathers, none of them were soldiers. And he could not have made it without. Could not. He, he, he saved the American Revolution. George Washington surely would have been captured and lost in Yorktown if Chaim Solomon had not gone in front of the uh, congregation of Israel and raised $20,000 in one day. Among all the other things, setting up the National Bank and helping get the country going, creating the foundation for the country. So that's the story of Chaim Solomon. I thank you so much for inviting me to come to chapel and talk with you. Okay. Yes, sir. I have a question. Um, Chaim's uh, children, are they um, dead? Yes, they are. Oh. Yes, they are. But I tell you, that's a very interesting question. His children, let's see if we can remember their names. Ezekiel? Um, Rachel. Um, Deborah. Rachel was his wife. Oh. Deborah. Deborah. Sarah and his son that he never met was named after him, Chaim Moses. <coughs> Why don't you see if you can find the descendants of Chaim Solomon? Why don't you look on a genealogy website and see if you can find, you've got their names, you've got the dates, see if you can find anyone who's a descendant of Chaim Solomon. Are you? No, I'm not. Ah! Joshua. I'm not. Joshua. I'm not. Uh, my family came to the United States in 1916. We need to give him an assignment. Yay! Let's be specific. Specific. Joshua, you have McDougal. Alexander oh, McDougal. Yes, I got a big guy. 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 guy. No, you can have the Sons of Liberty because I want a full report. There's a lot of interesting people in Sons of Liberty. Connie, you gave very little of the report. I want a full report next week on Sons of Liberty. Okay? This is, these are the corporate group that brought America through. Okay? Heine, Heine belonged to Sons of Liberty. He wasn't just an individual. He was a part of something that was bigger than himself. That's why he felt it so important that he gave how much of himself? All of it. All of himself. That's awesome. So, he was a very special man who most people, until Jonathan Heim Garber came along, <laughs> knew nothing. Okay? Most people have never heard of him. We've yeah. got a history we lesson the today did. that was very important because courage is not often seen. And when it is seen, you need to recognize it and appreciate it. Mm -hmm. He was a man who had tremendous courage. Mm -hmm. And you know what else the, I, the lesson I took from it? You see the value of an education? Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't have a formal education. Growing up as a Jew in Poland, he was not, didn't go to universities. And, uh, he came across and he picked up a lot of knowledge. He was open to learning from everybody he met. That's how he picked up all these languages. And his knowledge of languages and being able to connect people who couldn't connect themselves as a trader, as a, as a money changer on the docks, getting all the ship captains to talk to each other, 
his ability to connect people helped save the revolution as well. Without him, and it, so, so be aware that one of the lessons I take from Chaim Solomon is really being open to learning all the time. I'll give you one other thought too. You heard of me speak from time to time of a very special minister that lived during this time. His name was David Wilkerson from New York. Is he alive? Pardon me? Is he alive? He just passed away. Where? This year. This year. However, he's a very special man. And he said, and he traveled the world just like Hein did. Hein? No. Just like many of the revolutionaries did. Jefferson. Okay. He said Poland was the most spiritual nation he ever visited. What does that mean? That means they love God more than any nation. He had visited, and he visited the Jewish the Jewish ones in Poland and the Christians in Poland, and he recognized they had a very deep, deep appreciation for God. And he stated, "I've gone to all. I've gone to hundreds of nations. They were the most spiritual." Poland has quite a history, just like America does. Well, and. What other individual, well, we'll say this for another time, because you heard enough today about wonderful individuals. Next mm -hmm. week we'll talk more about the revolutionary, as well as who? Jordy. As well as who? That Jackson. wrote two books of the Bible? Luke. 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 Don't forget, we're going to talk about Luke all year long. And we're going to talk about those from the revolutionary world. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. One thing. Who's the Benedict guy? Benedict Arnold. Mm -hmm. Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold was actually, uh, I believe, hung for treason against the revolution. But it's very, it's very debatable how treasonous he was. He was uh, slighted by George Washington a number of times, looked over for promotions and other things, and. Actually, one could argue that he was driven to the British, but the, the, you do some research on him and find out. It's a little yeah. simplistic. It just happened to be that so his act of treason was handing over the keys to West Point to the British in the middle of the night. We'll talk about that later on somewhere along the way because yeah. he's a good example of how temptation can take a person. Mm -hmm. And how marrying the wrong person can take a person. Mm -hmm. Because he did both. He married the wrong woman who was British who drew him into that realm. And he couldn't handle being rejected and not promoted. Mm -hmm. and so instead of not handling it, he rebelled. That means he turned against him. So we'll talk about him because he's a good object lesson for him. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's bow. Stand up. Come to the next class. Let's bow and just seal our time in the Lord. Yeah, and the glasses? No, I need the boots. Yeah, sure. Where do you think he got them from? Saggy boots. I got these from my grandfather who came from Poland. <laughs> it's all about. Father, thank you for a very special time. Thank you, Lord, for the fact and the truth that it's a wondrous thing to behold someone who gives their all. And we did that today. We heard about someone who was very special. We thank you, Lord, for these special ones that give and give and give. And so we ask you today to be with every single one of us, that we would have a good day. We bless you in Christ. Amen. Okay.